Brown uh, wrote many bills. Um, with me are Patricia Pike and Jim Murphy. Um, they're the two that have the bills that we rolled together as a committee substitute. So I'll let them go ahead and kind of talk to you about, about Representative Brown and about the revenue bill. Representative Brown was an amazing legislator. She served for three uh, terms in the Missouri House. She was a champion of women, um, less fortunate veterans. Um, she was very passionate about the human trafficking uh, issues of the state and worked very hard on that on many levels. Jim? The thing I most remember about Gloria is, since she's from my district, is how beloved she was. The people in our district just, just fell in love with her. And as I went around and in my campaign, I would uh, go to doors and they would invite me in and say, you know, Gloria would come here often and we'd have coffee. And that was the type of person she was. She believed in her, in representing her people. It didn't matter if they were Republican or Democrat. She was just a, a f loving, caring person. And this bill is very appropriate because her, her final resting place actually overlooks the, the road that we're naming in her honor. And it, it, it's just very, very appropriate. What road is that? It's Lindbergh Boulevard, just uh, from uh, Interstate 55 to Lynn Ferry Road. And uh, it, it, it's just going to be perfect. The other thing we had today, obviously all of you know about the, uh, the, the, the budgetary issues with revenues lagging behind. Um, Representative Smith, our budget chair, um, he had a hearing today with the Department of Revenue, so I've asked him to come up, kind of talk, talk about that with you all, um, to what, what happened at the hearing today and sure. that process. Yes, the purpose of the hearing today with the House Budget Committee was to bring the Department of Revenue in and talk about this uh, lag in the state revenues uh, being collected at this point. At this time, as of today, we're over $500 million behind schedule uh, for state revenues, and that equates to about 10%. And so that, that is a very troubling number at this time as we're looking to go into budget for the FY 2020 budget. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't include the 1.7% uh, CRE that we had budgeted this prior year on. So ask them to come in, explain to us what, what has happened and uh, what their plan is going forward, and we did just that. So in the process of that hearing, uh, they, they stated there were a couple issues that caused uh, under withholding uh, for personal income taxes. One of those is a formulaic problem that dates back several years that was compounded by the federal tax changes that went into effect last year. Second one of those is the tendency that, that some folks have had to uh, to have their income over withheld and with the intention of, of receiving a refund at the end of the tax season. So with the federal, the federal changes that went into effect in, in 18, that the parameters of how that's done have, have essentially changed. So, so if you are claiming zero or one dependence or, or structuring your withholdings in such a way to, to try to get back a, a refund, the, the, the rules of that have changed and, and that will actually be much more accurate now. So, so that went into place, and, and they feel that uh, that's probably the, the, main, the main issue that we're seeing here. Uh, they weren't able to get the word out about that before people set up their W-4s generally in January of, of 2018. So this is a situation that we will continue to monitor very closely, and uh, they, they, they do have complete faith that we will catch up in revenue and that we, we will, in fact, uh, hit the 1.7 CRE that we've budgeted on. And uh, like I said, it's something that we will continue to monitor very closely and, and uh, keep an eye on as we work forward going on the next year's budget. Is it accurate to say, Mr. Chairman, that we have a $500 million shortfall? What, what's the accurate way you, you would phrase that about the $500 million? Yes, it's $500 million plus, And then if you factor in the 1.7% CRE, the growth that we had budgeted for, it's, it's even more than that. Uh, so yes, I, I would say that. Were you satisfied with that answer that the director Walter gave you guys? I thought that they were very thorough answers, and and uh, and you know, not being an economist or a CPA, uh, I I was satisfied with with the the explanations that, that they gave. Uh, we're we're very much hoping that they're correct that we will meet our our revenue uh, budgets by the end of the of the fiscal year. Uh, John Lima, I said this before, I apologize for coming in late. I'm interested, you know, you look at this, you gave, you had the tax cuts in 14 last year. You're saying today the tax, it's not because of the tax cuts, it's because of this holding issue. What's the level of uh, the emotion over the idea that you did all these tax changes to help people and now they might get hit with a lower refund or a possible tax bill? Sorry, were you asking? Both of you. Both. 
Um, this is this this issue we're having that we're talking about today is very clearly not to do with the tax cuts. Uh, the tax changes that we made last year just went into effect this year, and we've seen this problem starting in, in the summer of, of last year. So it's impossible for those those tax changes to be the case, um, and 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 there are a variety of, of well articulated explanations of why this is a withholding issue and not a tax rate issue. So I'm inclined to believe that that is the case at this point, and. Uh, and, and again, not to do with the tax cuts. What's the solution, though? I mean, is, is, is Minority Equates Bill the answer to, you know, just try and get you know, a little bit of that, I think, push it back till June? Um, what are you guys looking at? Sure. We talked about that, and the Department of Revenue is accustomed to working with people if they are, are get a surprise in April and they have to actually pay in where they may have been used to getting a, a refu refund or if their budget, li if their uh, tax liability. I'm sorry, that's not the right, to, the right way to say that. If they're, um, what's owed to the Department of Revenue is more than, and, than it has been in years past, uh, they are accustomed to and very commonly work with people to uh, give them terms that are, are friendly to help them get caught up and, and, and work with them on an individual basis. So we did talk about that specifically, and it's, they are of, a, of the opinion, and I agree, that it does not require a change in statute when the department is, is already able and willing to work with people on an individual basis. And in, in anticipation of a higher volume of these situations, they've actually started to ramp up their, uh, their department, various resources to handle a higher volume of these, these cases. Mr. Speaker, what is what is your you heard what Chairman Smith said, but a, he said more than a five hundred million dollar shortfall. What is your reaction to that? Well, I mean, I, none of these numbers are, are a surprise to us. We've kind of been tracking this all along the process. Um, you know, one thing I think it's important to to, to note is that last fall when we started noticing that these were tracking below it was, it was the house budget research team that, that really noticed this problem first they went to revenue several weeks before um, the tables were changed the house has always been really on top of this and i think um, that was made pre very clear in the hearing today i still am very confident that that as taxes begin to, to come in particularly as we get closer and closer to april 15th that we'll see those numbers come back this is not necessarily a, an issue of nothing more than, than changing when that money comes into the state, whether it comes in early versus late. Um, tomorrow you have a House Ethics Committee hearing dealing with the rules. I'm not sure if you would know this or you know this, but are there any significant changes that uh, will change how you um, react to ethical problems? Well, Representative Agelson is the assistant minority leader. He's also yeah. the chair of the Ethics Committee, so I'll let him handle that. Sure. We, we've looked Can, over the... You step over the sure. Sorry. Uh, you know, we've looked over the rules that we've had in the past years to make sure that everything that's in place is the way we want it. We've come up with a few tweaks to the procedure, but not a, really a major overhaul. Um, so we're going to discuss those tomorrow morning and uh, you know, try to come up with the best, best possible flow that we can for the, any of those uh, issues that may come up. Any examples of what those tweaks are? Um, there's a couple of simple renaming things uh, as far as what the different stages that we go through. There's, there's generally three stages that a, a complaint could go through. Now, hopefully we get uh, most complaints dispatched in, a, in an earlier phase, but what you call those, uh, exactly what rights that the, the complainant and the respondent have during those stages, and, uh, and what um, responsibilities as well as what capabilities the committee has during those stages, we're going to make sure that those are all right-sized for the way uh, we want them, we want them to do. Any other questions? PDMP. Where? When will that get a hearing? I know that's something that probably Raider is trying to push for this year. Any sense of when that's going to come up? Uh, I believe I've already referred that bill, um, and that's up to the chairman. Okay. Then, if uh, whenever the chairman decides to hear. Do you support? Do you support that legislation? I do. I voted for it every year I've been here, and um, I think we. If this is my seventh year, I think we passed it out five of the six years I've been here, and I voted for it every time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.